That's the American Radio Theater Scriptwriters Competition, 1616 West Victory Boulevard, Suite 104, Glendale, California, 91201. <laughs> ART Presents continues with a future perspective of a current regional sporting event. The True Story of Willard North, written by Robert Mann. Just once in my life I'd like to do something, do something outstanding. To be a winner rather than a loser. Yes, that's it. That's exactly right. I've never excelled at anything. And my 30th birthday is coming up and I... Yes. Well, my birthday is the same day as the backbreaker race. You desire to win the backbreaker race, is that it? Yes. Yes. Win a million dollars. Oh, yes! How much would you pay me? Anything. Maritime kingdom of fogs and mists, leagues to the south of Brogdingnag and Cape Mendocino, and leagues to the north of El Dorado, there lived a man named Willard North, a man who was destroyed by his failure to observe the single rule of a game he had agreed to play. Willard North lived in a time of chaos and confusion. Old rituals and traditions had perished. No one knew any longer what it meant to be a man or a woman a mother or a father, an aunt or an uncle, or, for that matter, a cousin. New rituals arose, expressing the primordial urge to celebrate the passing seasons, the winter, the spring, the summer, the fall. This was particularly difficult in the little kingdom because it experienced no seasons whatever. During the spring, which was usually a time of wet, pervasive fog in the little kingdom, a ritual race was run in which thousands of the kingdom's citizens and many foreign visitors stripped themselves almost naked and ran pell-mell across the capital city, a distance of some 11 kilometers. The race, known as the backbreaker, would start on every March 4th at 10 o'clock in the morning. It began in the plaza at the Gay Building and proceeded along Remission Street until, in the vicinity of the Municipal Palace, the racers veered like stampeding cattle, first to the right and then to the left, until they were properly aligned for the Hayes Street Hill, a fantastic obstacle on which dozens of runners had perished. On the corners of buildings, on lampposts, and even on the curb, little signs marked the spots where runners had fallen. Some of the markers were nothing more than rude scrawls on pieces of board. Others were elaborate ornamental plaques that bore enameled photographs of the deceased. From the top of Hayes Street Hill to the bottom on the other side, a stretch of several steeply descending blocks, runners became bunched together, sometimes becoming stuck together so tightly that they ran in clumps for the remainder of the race. Once back to level ground, the runners entered the most terrifying part of the race, running along a green strip of parkland known as the Pan Handle. This was where the owners of attack dogs, pit bulls mostly with snouts shaped like wire snippers, lurked in the bushes and set their animals on the passing runners. Quite a few of the runners had perished in the pan handle, as numerous plaques and memorial park benches placed there attested. The destruction of the runners seems to have had some religious significance, as is indicated by a large sandstone cross that greeted them as they began their dash through the gauntlet of attacked dogs. The cross to this day bears the inscription, Survival 
of the fittest. Once they had passed the attack dogs, the runners entered the great green park, which stretched for several kilometers from the center of the city to Ocean Beach, where the race ended. At the beach, the winner was awarded one million dollars, and everyone else was given a tongue depressor, which evidently had some symbolic meaning to the people of that time. The whole event was greatly celebrated by the electronic media of the kingdom, which broadcast images of the race to every civilized land. Although only one person could win the million dollars, thousands took part in the race. From contemporary documents and recordings, it is evident that many runners, no matter how old or young, how obese or infirm they were, believed that they really had a chance to win the million dollars. In fact, it seems that a small band of professional runners were the real competitors for the grand prize, although their presence in the race was not acknowledged in the official propaganda promoting the affair. Here now are some actual recordings made in the period just preceding the incident that engraved Willard North's name in history. This is Hamilton Beach with Councilperson Pellegrini. Tell us, Councilperson, what does the backbreaker race mean to you? The winner of this race shows the world that he's got the stamina, the courage, the fortitude. How about the speed? Well, yes, the speed. But I think the speed is really overrated, Ham. Anyone who really wants to win can win. It's a fair race and a good race. Uh, you, sir, what do you think of the backbreaker? Well, I like it. Oh, uh, yes. Ma'am? Well, I think it's a wonderful symbol. I mean, I really do. I mean, after all, that's what life is all about, trying for that million dollars. It doesn't matter whether you get it or not. I think the envious handful who complain entirely miss the point. That has nothing to do with it. But when the goal is there, oh, I think it's what, it gives meaning to what we do. It's a fact that you were willing to get out there on Remission Street and use your elbows and your feet to make a scramble for it. That's what shows that you're with your salt, in my opinion. Are you going to run this year? I would miss it for the world. Well, good luck. Almost every society has its dissidents, and the little kingdom was no different for most in that respect. Here's Hamilton Beach again, this time interviewing a youthful member of an anti-backbreaker group. Break the backbreaker. Break the backbreaker. I'm speaking with Debbie Okamoto, a student at City College and a leader of a student protest group which opposes the backbreaker. Debbie, what are your feelings about the race? Oh, well, I think it's for the birds. A sushi tatihaki is murderous. People are torn apart. And who the hell has a chance for the grand prize except... A few professional runners, and many of them come from foreign countries. People get killed in it, or they die of heart attacks. They are not in proper shape anyway. It's a mess. Mm -hmm. And what form will your protest take? Oh, we are getting flags and banners. Oh, we are going to have a Congo line that will be accompanied by musicians. And uh, we're going to Congo all the way around the city on the day of the race. Council person, council person, hold fast. We have learned that student protesters plan to form a conga line and to dance around the city. Yeah, well, they should be met with machine guns. <laughs> of course, they have the right to protest like everybody else, but they should not abuse that right by dance. What form do you think their protest should take? Well, hell, but they get to vote every two years, right? <laughs> and so, thanks to these ancient recordings, we can get a feeling for the climate of the times in which Willard North lived. But who was this man, Willard North? Willard North was a typical mediocre mailman. The voice of Derek Wong a supervisor at the post office where Willard North was employed for 10 years. The only thing that stands out about Willard in my mind is that he was slow, extremely slow. 
He did finally learn his zones from H Street to O Street and from First to Funston, but he was awfully slow sorting his mail, and he was even slower making his rounds. He even talks slow. We used to get a lot of complaints. You have to be quick in this business. Nobody likes a slow mailman. Willard North lived in the same apartment for ten years, a few blocks from the post office where he was employed. One of his former neighbors was interviewed the afternoon of the day that Willard became a celebrity. This is Hamilton Beach at the apartment next door to Willard North's home. Mm, yep, yeah. I'm Hamilton Beach. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, we were watching you on TV. Do, do you remember Willard North? <laughs> Not really. Uh, he just kind of slipped in and out. We had no idea he would ever do anything like this, so... <laughs> Here is a photograph of the Quick Fix Candle Shop in the Western Edition of the city. In the window, we see statuettes of Jesus, naked African tribesmen, elephants, and saints. It was to this little shop that Willard North came a few days before his 30th birthday, which happened to be the same day that the backbreaker race was to be run. The shop no longer exists. From notes left by Willard North in his diary, we can speculate as to what happened on the day he came here in search for help in transcending his dreary, drab existence. We do know that the shop was owned by a psychic by the name of Mama Ramara. Um, anybody here? Well, I see you have various charms and potions. There are all kinds of potions and charms here. They're all placebos. I have to say that. But really, they are quite potent. What is it that you desire? Um, well, you see, I don't have too many friends, and I never felt I could afford a wife and raise a family. And now I'm almost 30. Oh, it sounds as though you're feeling lonely. Uh, that's right. Only, it's not just that. You see, uh, the only thing I've ever done in my life is sort and carry other people's mail. And I'm not even very good at that. I'm so slow. Nobody likes a slow mailman. Yes. Just once in my life, I'd like to do something... Do something outstanding. To be a winner rather than a loser. Yes, that's it. That's exactly right. I've never excelled at anything. And my 30th birthday is coming up and I... Yes. Well, my birthday is the same day as the backbreaker race. And you desire... Do you have something that can make a person run very fast? You desire to win the backbreaker race, is that it? Yes. Yes. Sail up Hay Street Hill, glide down the Hay Street Hill, whisk past the pit bulls. Yes. Sail through the Great Green Park. Yes. Win a million dollars. Oh, yes! How much would you pay me? Anything. What is the most valuable thing that you possess? Oh. Well, I just saw on the TV that the insurance rating bureau has placed the value of a million dollars on a human soul. What a coincidence. You see, my employer's sole requirement is that I produce at least one human soul every year. You give me your soul, and I'll give you the shoes. Shoes? Magic running shoes. Just your size. My God. Beautiful, aren't they? They are yours for your soul. The price is your soul. I'll take them. Sign here, will it, North? Here they are. Now, there's just one little drawback that you should be aware of. Yes? What is it? You must not put on those shoes until the backbreaker race. And while you're wearing them, you must not stop for any reason or something very terrible will happen. Hmm. Well, that should be easy enough. I won't stop for any living creature. Good, good. Why should anyone ever stop for another living creature? And I will win, win, I, I will win the race? You have my personal guarantee. 
Just remember that one rule. <laughs> <laughs> the days must have passed very slowly for Willard North as he slowly sorted and delivered the mail to the people on A Street through O Street and awaited the day of the big race. Finally, the morning of the backbreaker and of Willard's birthday arrived. From this point on, we will rely on historic recordings to reconstruct the event. Buddy Jowls of Channel 17 News here, near the gay building on Trocadero Boulevard, where masses of people, more than ever before, I believe, are gathering here for the annual backbreaker race. Oh, it's a colorful scene. There are many scantily clad people. <laughs> I also see people in costumes. Oh, there's a group in tuxedos. Oh, there's some sort of musical group you can probably hear in the background. <laughs> A Romanian poet, clad only in tights and two large cheese balls he has strapped to his feet, is walking around the area. <laughs> Howard Cheeks at the starting line, awaiting the gun. The signal which will start this great traditional event. The 30th annual running of the Backbreaker Race. They're all! And, oh my God, oh my God! About two blocks in front of the starting line, a little child, a toddler, has wandered out into the path of the race. But one of the runners, an extraordinary figure in a red silk costume with red shoes, this red-clad runner in the lead of the race, stops. Oh, there you go, little fella. He runs back and scoops up the child and carries it to the safety of the sidewalk before resuming the race. Oh, no, I stopped. But now, this is amazing. The runner in the red shoes has regained the lead. And now, he's at least half a block ahead of the other runners. He must be one of the Australians. The runner with the red shoes. I can't believe it. He's making the first turn near the municipal palace. He is out of sight. He is already out of sight. It is an extraordinary thing. It's the most wonderful race I have ever seen. I'd better turn you over, rather prematurely now, to Rudy Pong, near the Municipal Palace. Well, Howard, it is amazing. This runner with the red silk costume and red shoes is almost literally flying past right now. The other runners are not tight. I can just barely hear them in the distance like little scurrying rats. But the Red Shoes runner has now passed me and is well on his way up to the foot of the Hay Street Hill. And he'd better turn this over now to Tom Gonzalez up at the top of the hill. I don't know why they're switching to me now. They're not supposed to switch to me for five minutes. Ah, it's a beautiful clear day. The visibility must be 25 miles. You can see the white cats on the ocean from here. I do notice a park bank to the south. I was just chatting with a Hay Street resident, Mrs. Uh... Ah, oh, Mrs. Alberta Smith. Oh, God almighty. What is it? Something's coming up the hill, and it's not Helen. Tom Gonzalez, here at the crest of something, is about halfway up the hill. It looks like a man. It's a solitary figure. He couldn't have started at the starting line. There are no other runners in sight. Man, look at that guy run. He's just flying up Hay Street Hill. Here he comes, past us. He's headed down the hill now. This is the runner who started at the starting line. He's headed for the panhandle. Let's switch now to Sandra Duncan in the panhandle. I'm in the mobile unit parked in the pan... Sir, could you get your dog away from the van? Oh, we put special quarter inch wire barriers in the windows of the van, but a pit bull almost shoot through one of them, and we may have to move... Some... Sir, please get your dog off the van. I'm not sure we can maintain our position much longer. There he is. I can see the man in the red shoes. He's now in the panhandle. He's going so fast, I can't believe it. The attack dogs are stunned. They're silent. They're just standing here staring at him incredulously as he goes by like a red blur. None of them is making a move towards him. The pit bull has just defecated in the apparent gesture of frustration and rage at the runner's speed. The man has disappeared into the park. He's left the other... This is Billy Conway in Channel 17 News Central. The mass of the runners is just approaching Hayes Street Hill. The extraordinary runner in the red shoes is somewhere in the great green park on its way to the beach. 
We don't have any coverage till about the midway point in the park. We'll pick that up just as soon as we get word of the runner in the red shoes. Well, now we go briefly to Tom Gonsalves on the street here. The bulk of the runners who must be a run away of the man in the red shoes is just approaching the hill. Some of the professional runners, runners from Australia and elsewhere, are nearly to the top. Three runners are passing us now here on the crest of the hill. They know all too well that the runner with the red shoes left them at the starting line. Looks of dismay on their faces. I recognize two of them as the Australian favorites, soccer favorites Fred McDermott and Ray Norton. The third man is number 485, and that would be Thomas Ryan, a local runner holding his own with the Australians. Now in the distance, we'll try to pick up the chance of the runners as they start up the hill. <laughs> This is Edward D. Young in the Great Green Park. The sight before me, a little red dot, has appeared in the distance on the main drive. He has just passed through the portals of the past. This is surely Willard North, for that is what we have learned from the runner's name to be from the number 0086, pinned to his red silk shirt. He's approaching at great speed. I think you may be able to hear his footsteps pounding along here in the silence of the park. He's not human. He's not human. I'm getting on the back of this motorcycle. Let's go. And we're going to try to get alongside of him. He's past us. He's past us. He's reached the great green window. How fast are we going? We're accelerating, but so is he. How do you feel? I think he said I'm in pain, or perhaps I'm feeling no pain. We're losing him. Bob Kipley, the Channel 17 helicopter. And we had some trouble earlier, but we've just caught up with Willard Dunn. And we're following him along the last kilometer of the course. I can't believe this. He's going so... But this is it. Victory for Willard Dunn. He is across the finish line. He's mobbed by the media people and photographers. I, uh, uh, what has happened is this, sir? He has not stopped. I repeat, the runner in the red shoes has not stopped. He's over the great sea wall, and now he's headed south along the ocean beach, running along partly in the water. Splashing as he runs, and uh, a line of people with colorful flags and banners stand along the cliff top, watching him as he disappears around the point. We have him in sight once again. Earlier, as I asked my wife, Pat, why doesn't he stop? Why didn't he stop to claim a million dollars? He just is enjoying himself too much. Or perhaps, as she said, he can't stop. Now we are continuing to follow him. He is nearing the end of the great highway. The helicopter continued to follow Willard North as he ran south along the coast until the pilot lost him in the fog at a place called Devil's Slide. Two young hikers were the last people to have seen Willard North. Oh, man, I haven't been able to run so fast in my life. I guess it was a man. Oh, it must have been some miracle, modern technology. Those red shoes. He just flew right past us in a blur. He went right down. It's hard to tell what happened. It's so foggy. I know, but it looked like he lost control and just sailed out into the fog. He did. He just went sailing right out over the ocean. And so ends the story of Willard North. A mediocre man, as best we can make out. A non-entity, really. A man who never really excelled at anything. Out of what? Envy? Pride? This man sold his soul for a moment of glory. And yet, can't we find something redeeming in the fact that Willard North was, in the end, a winner?
True Story of Willard North, written by Robert Mann, was directed by Patrick Bannon. Heard in the cast were Mark Silver, Larry Dilge, Bill Forward, Marlene McCormick, Rob Zappel, Joseph Talarowski, Allison Evans, Miguel Marcotte, Jamie Spearer, and John Tartaglia. Sound effects were performed by David L. Krebs. Theme music for ART Presents was composed and performed by Jack Adams. Recording engineer, William Burkuta. Post-production facilities were provided by Birkin Sound Recording Labs. Be with us again soon for another hour of radio drama on ART Presents.